start recording. Okay, so tonight we're going to cover game audio. And as I was chatting beforehand, the idea is that you can certainly add some good game audio. Um, ah, right, I'm not sure if the students on Discord know that you're streaming here. All right, I'll, I'll tell them on Discord. Actually, usually what I do on Discord is I also start streaming to Discord. So I'll jump into the lecture feedback there, share my screen, grab... Uh, not I grab... Uh, that screen and go live. Okay. Nope, that's not the screen I wanted to share. <laughs> so I'll just change window and make sure I actually get the proper window. Looks like I'm going to have to share that one and go, go live. And I'll jump these out and make it big so that they they can see it. There we go. There we go. Right, okay, so I'm now <laughs> uh, streaming both on Discord and on um, and on Twitch, so people can watch me in either place. Uh, and we are recording. Okay, great. So we're going to talk about game audio now. Um, we can we can look at some things in audio. We'll, we'll bring up some of the FMOD stuff, and we can we can do some of those tutorial style stuff. But a lot of that you can do on your own. What I was looking at doing today is, is talking about some of the high level concepts and some of how we go about developing game audio and why we do it. So um, if we look at, at how we use game audio, okay, so obviously game audio are the sounds in your game. Now the, the normal ones that we think of are the narrative sounds, right? And these are the sounds that, that interact with the player and, you know, they're all the sounds that we use to work with the player like when you, your footsteps and your gun, gun firing and and um, the dialogue all of those sounds uh, are kind of narrative use sounds however we also use sounds in games in other interesting ways right we use them to draw attention to things right so the idea is that if we're if we're trying to make someone pay attention to something if we add sounds to it it makes it seem more important it becomes part of the world and part of what the game's focused on, right? And so there's this, it, it, it's not so much about if, like exactly what kind of sound you use, it's that you're using it to draw the player's attention to something relevant, okay? So that's a how we use it. Um, there's an interesting way that we're using sound where, where we start to using some of those ambient sounds, some of the diegetic sounds, the sounds in the world, to give the world a sense of space, because humans use our our sense of hearing to tell us about being in a large echoey room or in a very small room or if there's lots of things around us. Those give us a feeling of the space that we're in. So we can also look at how we use sound to convey that concept of the world you're in in terms of the scale of it um, and, and the sort of size and shape. We also, of course, use music and audio to look at how we create atmosphere for our games. Right, so it's it's again um, not just the narrative sound that we we think of when we think of sounds, but it's also these these emotional affective sounds to create that atmosphere. We use it to intensify action. Where if you've got a combat scene, you can bring in additional audio, lower beats. You can bring in different music to try and, and emphasize the, the kind of engaging activity that you're doing at the time, okay? And uh, for VR, um, as, as you've seen, VR headsets now often will come with headphones because the audio really helps with immersion because the, the, one of the big values of VR is that it's very immersive. Now, if you don't um, have an audio and you're just connect, disconnected from the world and you're just seeing everything visually then you don't feel as connected as inside the world 
And I, unlike some games, I mean, when you're, when you're playing on screen, you're not in the world. And so turning off the audio or listening to your own music while you play a game, it's not that you're trying to feel like you're inside the game. You're playing like chess. You're playing in mechanics. You're playing the, the world you can see. When you're in VR, part of the point of going to all that additional work of putting something on your face and potentially setting up your VR stuff is to feel immersed. And so the audio becomes a really important part of that. And we'll talk about binaural and audio later. We can also use sound for pacing, particularly when we're looking at, at the beat of the, the music we use. Now, there's some really interesting research on, on how relating beat to the normal heart rate. So if you have your, the beat of your music slightly above the resting heart rate of your player, then it will up their mood. It brings them up, it, it raises the intensity. If you can place that beat slightly below the heartbeat, it will slow them down, right? So there's some physiological things we do with music and sound to change the feeling that people have, right? Um, and so there's this idea that you can actually adjust the, the pacing of, of tempo of things by changing the tempo of some of the music or, or the tempo of some of the sounds that are being made. Uh, we also use audio to indicate mode transitions. So one of the things you'll see in games, particularly when they, they move from interactive gameplay into a cutscene, one of the smooth ways of indicating that without like, you know, blurting out cutscene as a piece of text or something, is to use an audio trigger to tell the player that you're changing mode from where they're in control to a cutscene, right? Now, sometimes you do that with a, uh, a camera swing, right? Where you go from behind, like you go from over shoulder kind of third person video to suddenly swinging out and seeing a scene, right? And when you've swung out and seen a scene, you can't interact with it, so you know that this is a cutscene. Um, but reinforcing some of that with an audio transition, where you play some music or you, you take a different, um, um, a different type of music in, the players might not notice it, but it will change the way they're thinking, and that allows you to switch mode without them going, hey, I didn't know I was, I was no longer in control, because you've triggered them that this music tells them they're no longer in control. Okay, So this is the idea, that there are, there are lots of ways we use audio, and there are different types of audio. Okay, So, these are kind of, so when I, we talk about game sound, I don't just mean making sure there are bullets sounds when you fire the, like when you fire the gun or when you walk, there is footstep sounds, or you know when I hit the the wall with my sword or hit another sword, I have a clang sound. Yeah, no, that's yeah, no, you don't. That's that that that's one part. That's kind of narrative. It's it's the in game. All of these others are important atmospheric things that go on. Okay, so some of the terms that you you will see when you start talking about the types of game audio. So we have dynamic audio. So dynamic audio. Um, is audio that is is changing, right? Uh, and we have adaptive and interactive, right? So you have static audio, you have just your standard audio, which is kind of just completely background stuff. But um, adaptive audio is stuff that uh, that will change and adapt as the game's progressing. And interactive audio is things that change in response to the user's actions, right? Now. Um, Adaptive audio could include things like adaptive background music, which we'd call um, non-diegetic. So that ability to adapt the music of the game to the mood of the game that you're in. Right. So there are some some games which which when you have different enemies or different threat levels, they'll raise the bases base of the music they're playing. Um, so you've got sort of background music, but they'll change the components of that music depending on the level of safety you have in the game. And that's adaptive, non-diegetic audio, right? So there's dynamic audio is stuff that adapts. Interactive is where I, as a player, directly interact with, with those things, right? So adaptive just adapts to the environment. Interactive means I, as a player, interact directly with it. Um, now, we have two types, diegetic and non-diegetic. Now, this is a word you probably haven't heard before. How many of you have heard of diegetic? 
have I got anybody? We some you sometimes hear diegetic in in um, design when they also talk about um, user interfaces. Okay, first time for at least one of you. So diegetic means to be embedded inside of the thing. So for example, I, and, and so we can you know we can do the Google um, diegetic. Um, so and you can see diegetic. The first thing that comes up is is, is sound, but diegesis. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you've heard of it, but not sure what it means. So, of course, you know, because we're academics and we're trying to sound poncy with each other, we try and use sound words that that have a very specific meaning, so we sound clever. Um, but you know, eh. Um, so yeah, it it you don't have to to use it this way, but it, it is what people use to talk about. Um, Things being, as it says here, details about the world itself, right? So there's this idea of it's, it's part of the world. So um, the world itself, the experiences of characters related to explicitly through narrative. The story is told or recounted as opposed to being shown or acted. Um, there is a presumed detachment from the story um, of both the speaker and the audience. So diegesis is in, in fiction is that. So um, mim mimesis and diegesis, uh, if we talk about diegetic sound and non-diegetic sound, um, you'll find sound whose source is visible on screen or whose source is implied by in presence in the action of film. Okay, so voices of characters, sounds by objects in the story, sounds represented as coming from instruments in the, in the world, right? So the idea, so, so as I said, it's the real sounds. So this idea, um, that it it is not sound effects. It is things like like weapon clashes is diegetic sound. Uh, footsteps are diegetic sound. They are part of the world. Um, they're not part of the HUD. Now all the HUD sounds um, are non diegetic sounds. The background like so background music right um, and some of the effects sounds so. So when we, what I mean here is not the, the and, and I see I've, I've created a little problem of diegetic sounds can be called effects, but um, when we mean sound effects, we mean, um, I mean some of these things where like mouse overs on buttons, rollovers on buttons, um, which are beep, uh, or things like that are probably non-diegetic sounds, right? Because uh, when I look at a button or hover over a button, it doesn't actually make a noise. Um, however, you could have a click sound, which you would say was diegetic, because when I click a button, it might make a physical click sound. If I record a physical click sound, add that to a button, I might claim, oh, that's a diegetic sound. Now, uh, that's a bit on the edge here, right? But uh, so, so in games, usually what we mean by diegesis and diegetic sound is the things you can see. Um, now, you would have watched movies, hopefully, um, where they have what we normally consider non-diegetic sound become diegetic sound. So if, hopefully uh, you may have seen movies where you've got some background music, and usually they're comedies, and the characters are walking, and then they walk past a band who is playing the audio you can hear. Right? Now, it's a funny thing because it kind of breaks the fourth wall. It takes what we thought was an overlaid audio that the characters couldn't hear, right? So that often that's another way we make the separation between diegetic sound and non-diegetic sound is the characters in the game can't hear non-diegetic sound because it's not in the world, right? So, so it's the background audio or you interacting with the HUD. You don't expect your first person character when you click a button and there's a you know an audio sound of the menu popping up you don't expect the character in the game to go around where was that right or look around as if there was a sound that disturbed them because you're affecting the hut right that's that breaks that that disconnect it breaks that fourth wall which says this is hud this is my music and this is the diegetic sound which the character can hear, whereas I can, whereas I can hopefully hear everything. There are things that they, they, that, that the person I'm playing, my PC, play character, 
they can't hear that non-diegetic sound, right? So, so that's kind of one of the differences. And so when you're recording the audio and you're talking about what kind of audio you're adding, um, understanding that these are different modes of audio, uh, turning them on and off has different effects um, on the players and the immersion. Um, and sometimes you'll have, have effects and affects being used, um, affects related to emotions and effects, sound effects, which are kind of all the sounds. Um, now, unfortunately, some of the problem is with some non-diegetic sounds, there is music and there's sound effects, which may or may not be diegetic, but some of the, you know, blip, blip, and chirpy sounds that you might get related to your interface are non-diegetic unless they're in the world, okay? Um, hopefully that makes sense that there are those two different things and that there are different types of audio. Okay, so those are the kind of some, like the, sometimes how we use it, some of the terms we use. You might also get Foley is used to talk about recording some of those diegetic sounds in the real world so you can bring them into your game. Um, now, I was very dear friends with a, with a, a sound engineer called Jury Pump. Um, uh, unfortunately, he passed away four years ago, but um, before that, he, he had a studio in San Fran and in Oslo, so he came and worked in Norway um, and set up his own studio in Norway and was doing a lot of the game sound. And so we had him come and help um, setting up our kind of the audio lectures and discussing how he does game audio. And he helped with many of the Norwegian game companies. Um, for him, the first thing he would say as the most important thing was process. That's so why it's process, process, process. Because what he found is that it was making sure that all the files were managed correctly. Because unlike um, image files, right? So when you've got a whole bunch of textures or image files, you can have your um, file system up and you can have thumbnails of all of those and you can scan your eye over them and you can see them all, right? And if they're all headshots and one of them, and they're all of the characters, all the people, and then suddenly there's a donkey, you can go, ah, that's the donkey that shouldn't be there, right? Because you've got those thumbnails. And even for videos, you can have thumbnails, videos, and it usually gives you a fair idea of what the video is about. With the audio, you can't look at it and just know whether it's right or not. You've got to sit there and listen to every single one of them to find the one that's wrong. Because it might have the right length and it will have a wavy form, but it doesn't. We don't visually have a way of cueing us in to what it is at a thumbnail level. And so we set up our workflow so that our naming conventions and we use scripting to move things around and copy things uh, and we have tests for all the files and we test the files as they go in so that we know that the process of moving them isn't just me by hand doing it, it's all automated so that we don't lose track of things or manually get something wrong because it's harder to see it's wrong in the audio files. All right, so that's probably one of the biggest differences between all the other assets in your game and the audio files in your game is you don't thumbnail them. You're also dealing with large numbers of files that all have relatively similar sizes and um, if there are missing or glitchy audio, it can really throw characters out. Um, so, so there's this idea that, that you want to, to make sure that you don't have mistakes in your audio. Now, some people won't appreciate your audio, so if your audio is, is you know, good, people might not go, hey, man, your audio was good. And uh, they might go, oh yeah, that was fine. Uh, however, if you get it wrong, they will notice and it will throw them out of the experience, right? So it's, it's so for, there's a kind of a hygiene factor um, for some of the audio, which is it has to be good enough so that it doesn't throw people out. Luckily, there is actually a, a, a value, a, a linear improvement for um, improved sound quality. And some of your players will really notice when the environments have beautiful audio connected to them. Um, but yeah, there's a, a, a threshold where everybody notices when it's bad and then only a few people notice when it's really good. Okay, so what is the process? 
Uh, so I said process, process, process. Well, the audio process is design, right? So you start thinking about you know how how you're designing your game. You're going to design a, a, an intent for the audio, right? So we go back to what are we using the audio for? So what's the intent of the audio? We then describe what it is we want the audio to be. We can go out and either record those or find them in our library, um, and then. Even if you've got a sound you think is reasonably good, you're still going to edit it to fit the game, particularly the timing on the event that you have, um, and, and edit the start and end of it to make it fit with what you need it to. You then mix it with the other audio sounds. Now that can be done in your game engine. You can either mix in real time or you can pre-mix. The advantage of pre-mixing is it decreases your CPU load at the time, So, and, we, and we're, we're in core game loops. They're very keen on decreasing that um, CPU usage. However, uh, we're getting pretty good at doing CPU now, so what we do is we can we can mix in real time more often now. However, sometimes, like lighting, you can bake in the lighting, you can kind of bake in the audio by pre-mixing parts of the audio. However, if you've got some of those adaptive or interactive audios where you need it to change depending on the user action, so the interactive audio, directly user action, then you can't pre-mix it. However, for background sounds and for ambient sounds and music, you might actually pre-mix those for particular areas. Uh, so you don't have to do any of the, the calculation in real time. Um, we then, you publish it, which is you, you having mixed it, got it right, you then put it in its final format, and then you make sure you clean up all of the directories, get rid of all of the audio files that aren't being used, or that are the wrong audio files, or, and so you, you clean up any leftovers. Now, audio files aren't huge, so you're probably not gonna, gonna, um, gonna have a problem, but without the cleanup, you, it can often be that a sound you didn't intend to get in gets referenced and gets added because it happened to be included in the folder of sounds, right? So, so you, you actually have to manage what you hand into the game so that it doesn't end up getting accidentally used. Okay, so that's the process that, that we use. Now, um, one of the things that when you're doing this, this recording, right, so that, that recording phase, we do have to think about the quality of audio. Okay. So, um, and this relates to compression, sampling rate, and our recording setup. Now, I have my, my Rode microphone here, and I have the microphone on my um, uh, webcam. Um, your, your microphones on your iPhones are now actually pretty good, uh, as are the microphones on, on um, mobile phones. They're, they're actually much better than they used to be. Um, so they, they're getting better as a recording device. Uh, and certainly um, the videos and cameras on on these devices are are, are very good. Um, now, if you're going to do a lot of your own audio recording, you probably do want to either borrow or buy a reasonably good quality field microphone. Now, I know in Jervik, uh the media um, group, the media department, um, design department, have audio recorders and field microphones, and they lend them out. Uh, I think they might be in the library, so you guys might be able to go and borrow some of those and see if you can see if you can get on the list of people who can borrow the microphones. Um, and if you want to go and record some sounds, they give it's a it's a good microphone for doing that recording. You record those sounds, you come down, you you dump them into. Audacity or FMOD, and I'll show you those tools later. Um, and then you can record in it with a reasonably quality microphone. Ideally, you want to record in a in a proper sound dampened room. Uh, and you'll notice um, that there are some of these that have been set up over in um, Mustad. Uh, in Yuvik, so that you can actually have a, a bit of a sound damped room. So, so for most of your games in this course, you don't need that level of audio quality, right? We're not going to measure you on your audio quality, but it is interesting to go through that process to learn it. If you're interested in audio, try doing it in different ways. Try working out what what you need to create reasonably good audio. 
And to do that, you need to go everything from let's just record it on the phone to see if that works, through to let's borrow a microphone, through to let's go into a studio. Okay, so each of those will give you different quality audio and playing with those different quality audio and seeing how, they, how you can use them in your game tells you how much effort you should go to to get good quality audio. And honestly, a lot of audio is in the hardware and the initial recording. You, you can clean some of up in software with, sound, sound can, with noise cancelling and you know pop cancelling and there's a whole bunch of things you can do in software. But if you can get a cleaner hardware initial recording, that makes the rest of the job in software so much easier, right? So if you can, get your audio quality great. Um, and in fact, that's why um, with uh, my own streaming, right, um, I'm just using like, you know, a pretty standard Logitech um, webcam, but we went with the Rode microphone um, so that we would have better quality audio rather than better quality video, right? Because you guys actually don't really need to see me much, but my audio quality is really important, okay? Now, um, that's recording. We can also generate audio. So MIDI is the, the idea that there is... Um, okay, <laughs> someone's having to disappear off. I'm recording this, so, so it's all good to, to disappear off and, and um, see, we'll, we'll see you later. Um, that idea of, of generating, uh, you can get MIDI files. MIDI files are the kind of musical note equivalent of computer-generated um, audio. So, the, so it used to be that MIDI was really, really terrible, right? Because it was simple descriptions of notes and you'd get a really bad synth and you'd play synthesized sounds from the MIDI and it would sound like 1980s games, right? Some of those are my best memories of games, but they did sound pretty awful. Um, however, MIDI now, with amazing synths and amazing reproductions of sound. So one of the uh, one of the neat one of one of the neat things I, I saw was the so one of the MIDI um, playback devices, one of the synthesizers they had uh, for piano music. Um, it didn't just play the string note of the key, right? So if you pressed a C, you didn't just get a, a C. You also had the wooden sound of the wooden um, key hitting the pad and the echo in the wooden structure of the piano. So you could hear the keys hitting. Now, it seems like that would be noise, that you'd want that not to be there and and you usually like so when you don't hear it you don't notice that you don't hear it but it doesn't quite sound like a piano and then they add that and you go oh yeah that does sound better right so there's this idea that 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 these subtle additional sounds follow-on sounds really make a difference and we can we can go and find some audio of that and i can show you some of those but but this idea that that there's there's that improved quality of audio now in midis means that you can have script and like score sheet right the idea of you have all the notes and you can get those to be played by these complex synthesizers they also now have ai where you can tell it to play more like a human which creates interesting slight variations and in the timings of the notes and and those sort of things to to make it feel more authentic and alive so so ai has come a long way in turning sheet music into a performance okay um and that basically is a, there's this audio description that tells you how to how to create the music from that. Okay, so, but I the reason I'm not sort of going into that is because I don't expect many of you to be audio composers. I'm talking about this so that you know these are the options that you have for generating audio, so you can talk to an audio person to generate that audio. Okay, so mixing. So this is another thing that happens with audio in our games, is that we are mixing games and we're playing multiple sounds at the same time. So this is the idea that we're mixing two soundtracks together to play them. Now, 
When I started playing games, there was no mixing. So you either had sound or no sound. And if you were playing one sound, you couldn't play another sound over top of it or be playing background music. It was awful. Um, now, when we first got, oh, pre-mixed mixed, mixed sounds, they actually pre-mixed them because there was no CPU to do real-time merging of two different soundtracks. That's pretty much gone now. In all your game engines, you have mixing of, of sound. But you get to decide how those, ga those sounds are mixed. Right? So you, you have those fade in and fade outs, and you, you can determine when a sound starts to fade in. You can use um, either code or script or blueprints or the audio editing tool to work out how you mix the set multiple sounds that are playing in your game. Um, you have this concept of a sound manager in your games that is playing when and how often to play sounds and how to mix them and how to how to interact with those and so whichever engine you're using you can go and have find those tools run through the tutorials for those tools and you'll be able to mix your audio and and transition between different audio sequences um, and this is where we get when we some of the terminology in the sound manager in games um, you have kind of this concept of instant play where um, if I'm firing a gun right and I hit I left click and the gun flashes, I want there to be a bang then. I don't want to queue up a bang for later, right? It's got to be instant. You can have th some things which will queue up sounds and they'll play the sound the next time there is an opportunity. Now that's more some of your background music where you're, you've got, you're playing a current music track and you want the mood to change. And so you cue the next one for when this one gets to the right bars so that it can merge into the new music, right? So that's queued up music. There's once only, so the bullet sound would be once only. There are some that will loop while something is happening, right? So you come up to a flowing river. You might have an audio track which is two or three seconds long and you'll play that and then loop it, right? Because I'm standing near a river, the flowing river, the audio will loop. Now, ideally, with a river flowing audio loop, each loop you change subtly the frequencies or subtly the the um, the duration, so that I don't get to hear the repetition. I have each repetition is a slight variation from the previous one. Um, another way is that you overlay two sounds of running water, but you offset when you overlay them. So rather than having this one and then this one, you have a start of an overlap and then you have a, this one overlap at a different point. And so because they've got two sounds that are constantly overlapping and, and, and mixing, the harmonies and the beats, don't, you don't hear this constant repetition and you don't hear that harsh merge because it has this overlapping flowing effect, right? So there are some neat ways you can do looping without having a hard joint. Um, and you know you can make some louder and softer and that, that can help with that kind of how you amplify sounds and, and, and how you manage those sounds. With volume controls, um, often you'll have individual sound controls. So in your game engine you'll be able to control the volume of individual sounds, you'll be able to group sounds and control the group volumes. And usually in the settings for the player you allow them to change overall volume of different types of sound, right? Or the different categories of sound. So sometimes you'll call them music and you'll call effects, right? Um, and you might even have UI sounds, right? So you create three categories and they can change those volumes and you have one for everything. Um, for you as a game designer, you'll also have individual control of, audio, of, of volume because you will want to be able to kind of get it to the right sound in comparison to other sounds when the player has them all running at max. Okay. So on the world up, so, we're, so if you remember back when we talked at the beginning of the course about what a game engine does, so when the, the game engine has a world update, right? So there's a time delta, there's a, there's a tick, and it goes, right, um, this is the new scene that we're rendering. The sound engine gets that tick update and it looks at all the sound requests that come in 
it updates all the audio states, processes the, the audio um, events, uh, and it looks for any end of file hooks that have come in. So you've been playing an end of, you've been playing an audio file and an end of file hook has come in in that frame and you go, right, what am I supposed to do at that end of file hook? Am I supposed to loop it? Am I supposed to blend it? Am I supposed, what, am, what am I doing at the end of that file? Is that gonna trigger me for some sort of follow-on animation, any of those sort of things, right? So that the sound manager gets all that information. Now, the sound manager is slightly different to the visual manager because you don't hear sounds in individual ticks. They are a constant um, buffer that is raising and lowering the amplitude, the position of the speakers, all the way through the frames, right? So you have a buffer that you've pushed the audio to, and for the whole of that frame, it's working through, the, your sound card is working through the audio it has been sent by the game, okay? So each frame, you get to interact with that buffer you've sent, right? But you've got to send it a buffer, you've got to send it stuff to play until you next get a chance to tell it what to do, okay? So there's, to, and, and you know, Depending on the hardware, how much interruptible it is, you, it may be challenging to change the ballistic sound you've sent it to, to actually stop playing that and start playing something else. So there's a lot of like managing audio that you need to do. Um, it, depending on the quality of the audio management tool that you're using. Okay, so um, when we get into, so, and so those, that's kind of the, the process. Uh, now there's some, internal audio tools that we can talk about. There is faders, so when we're doing the, audit, um, the editing, um, a fader is a slider that controls volume control. So if, we, if someone, if you're talking to an audio engineer and they talk about a fader, um, that's that, those dials that you can move up and down and they affect volume. Right? Uh, a channel is a single sound. Right? So uh, if I have eight channel, I have eight audio files that I can play. So if I had eight channel audio, it would mean I'd be able to play eight different sounds overlapping simultaneously, right? Um, and so when I have a, uh, so when I'm controlling the, the volume of channel, uh, I'm controlling that, that file, right? We have buses and groups, Right, which is the parent control over a group for, for mixing and sound th and for, for volume control. Uh, and mix the snapshots of all the volume parameters, blending one sna sh snapshot to another is like keyframes and animation. So what you do is you imagine you've got your board of all these different volumes set up. You hit, and that's a snapshot, and then you go from that keyframe to another keyframe, which is a snapshot to a snapshot, and it smoothly changes the audio. So you can imagine if I came in with voice high and music low, and then I had another sh snapshot of voice low and music high, I could f do a fade between those two just by doing right now a snapshot blend, and it would blend me from high uh, speaker volume to low speaker volume, low music to high music, and it would just do a smooth transition over a set length of time. Okay, so these are the faders, the channels, the bus, and the snapshots. So that's the the, the terms that audio people will use for these. Okay. Also, when we think about sound, sound is is an interesting um, environment for humans because our the way we see the world is kind of two and a half D, right? It's kind of, we we think of it as three D but our eyes aren't really far enough apart to do a lot of 3D reconstruction. We mostly do, oh, you're a plane at that distance, oh, you're something at a distance behind that. I don't have really good depth estimation because my eyes aren't that far apart that have got really good two separate cameras on the world. I have kind of a, a 3D reconstruction going on with Audio, we tend to have a planar understanding of audio. There's a little bit you can get above and below and above and behind and below and behind, but it's it, your up and down is not really very good. It's mostly where it is in, in the plane 
And so if you want to know if something's high or low, you tend to tilt your head, right? So you, if, you, if you tilt your head, then you change that plane, and so you hear things on a different plane. And so if something was higher, then you'll hear it being higher because you've tilted your head, right? So, so we actually can use the, the plane of our, of our ears to work out if things are higher or lower, right? Um, now, one of the interesting things about 3D sound is that when we create 3D sound, um, we have stereo. So you can have stereo that's onto um, speakers, right? And they generate audio. And then our head interprets that, right? Now, when I'm wearing these, that creates a different stereo environment, right? But it it's changes the volume to each ear, so I can hear something louder on this side than this side, and it feels like it's coming from that direction. So, and you would have he heard this when you stand, play your standard stereo, you have left and right um, feeds, and you'll hear something louder on this side or louder on that side, right? Uh, now, if you're standing there and you've got two big speakers uh, in your room and you're playing the audio, um, it sounds like you're kind of in that space. When you've got your headset on, sometimes it doesn't quite sound as realistic, right? Um, but with general XY and almost all of the game engines allow you to do this, they allow you to create, when you create a sound, you don't just have to say, oh, play this audio. You can now place the audio in the world and say that it has a location. And then that will create 3D audio from the location you put it in the world. So I'll hear it from that location. Now, if it's UI sound, you want to place it at the camera, right? So it's kind of matched on my head. So when I click buttons and do UI stuff, it's kind of right here. Whereas for footsteps or for gunfire or those sort of things, you, you want to use stereo and place them in the right place. Now, the, the new thing that games are doing, and if you're wanting to get the kind of best audio effect, because most of us are now doing this, right? Um, I, most of us have headphones, right? And certainly gamers often have really good headphones. One of the interesting things is that stereo, 5.1 or 7.2 or whatever you're using, they generate the sound as it was recorded, right? So, so you can say, oh, I want it to play as if there is a drum over there. And if I've got a speaker over there and I'm playing a drum sound from that direction and I'm standing here, it sounds like there's a drum over there. However, when I put my headphones on and I play the sound directly into your ear, then this side doesn't get to hear it. And so I, it doesn't quite feel the same. What binaural sound does, binaural sound does, is it creates, as you see in the image there, a dummy head, puts the, um, the microphones in the ears of the dummy head with a dummy ear, and then records the sound. And that creates a bunch of really interesting effects. It creates a head shadow, where if something's in front of me, I get the effect of my ears channeling it into my ear canal. But when it's to the side, as soon as it gets past a certain area, my head itself shadows this, this ear. So the volume changes on this ear and the timing changes from this side of my head to this side of the head. Doesn't sound like that should be much, but because it is in line with what the brain understands about the world, the brain is under, able to hear that timing difference and infer, oh, if it's arrives exactly the same time, it's directly in front, but if it arrives slightly different, right, if this is slightly further away, then it's probably over on that side. And if it's louder on that side and it arrives slightly sooner, you know, very, very fine timing sooner, then it reinforces the position of that audio. And so that's partly why that, that accuracy of the delay, the, the idea that things behind me are playing and there is air shadowing being created. So I, I hear it slightly differently when it's over there and slightly differently sound. All of that creates that much better, the virtual barber shop is something that someone just popped up in the, in the um, uh, 
Discord, which is that, and particularly in VR, right? So, so I talked about this as, as you know, when I'm wearing headsets, where I wear headsets and where it's really, really matters is this idea of being in VR. And I know that you've got the ear, like the sound going straight into your ears. And so I try and recreate the effect of having a head. Huh? That sounds a bit weird. I've got a head. Why would I need to recreate the effect of a head? Well, the problem is when I generate the sound right here, I'm not getting my head shadow on the sound coming in. Right? One of the other things we sound with VR, if you have a fake nose in the VR scene, so that people put the VR headset on and they see a slightly larger fake nose in front of them, decreases motion sickness. Right? Which is weird. Why would you add a fake nose and have people decrease their motion sickness? And people don't even notice the fake nose, but they get less sick. Right? It's kind of weird. But part of that is recreating bits of the world for us make it easier for our brain to immerse ourselves in that world and feel comfortable that yes this is the way the world interacts okay so that's why binaural sound is a different experience to just standard stereo and why they also sound say that binaural binaural audio isn't great in your normal sound speakers because you will hear that slight delay on one speaker than the other right and that sounds like it's a bit off it doesn't sound quite right anymore but that's because it's designed specifically to be in your ears rather than played through your normal stereo okay so um this is what yeah so when we're, we're looking at games and and uh certainly there is um and i think oh i didn't give the link um there are i think i give the links to the there are tutorials on doing um, binaural sound uh, in Unity and Unreal, right? Um, I don't know if, if there is, SFML will have a binaural sound, but um, you can record binaural sound um, if, like with the setup. Unity and Unreal both provide ways of creating binaural sound from your game, right? So there are, they're, they're, they're trying to make these much better. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's kind of where sound, some of the VR and game sound audio is going. Um, if you're going to listen to binaural sound, make sure you do it with headphones, and it does feel much more immersive. And because that's the point of VR, that's why we put so much effort into it. Speech translation. So one of the things that we also do when we're doing game audio uh, is that we look at um, not just English or Norwegian, um, we have to say, well, okay, if I'm going to have my game play in multiple languages, I'm going to have to have different sounds for different languages, which create a whole bunch of, of different sound assets that will be selectively played. Um, there are problems if you just, you know, as you run in Norway, um, you certainly have a lot of dialects, and so playing audio the characters and the dialects of characters matter a lot, right? So if you get a really good voice actor in English, it sounds great, and then you just let any old random people translate it into another language, and it sounds awful, right? Um, and I'm sure you've had that experience with some television programs where uh, potentially some of the Scandinavian um, translations of the, or Scandinavian voice actors just don't nail the role the way some of the English actors do. And I'm sure there's the other way around where like, it sounds great in Norwegian and then we translate to English and the English translation is uh, a bit sad. Um, and so that quality of voice acting matters in some of those translations. Dialects matter they, because they come with a whole bunch of well, tropes with a whole bunch of additional baggage around um, what different cultural aspects come with the sound of the way you speak. Um, there is different lengths when you translate, and that creates problems when you're doing an animation of people speaking, that if someone needs to have the audio run longer, right? Because if, if you're just playing a text dialogue, you can have an extra line of text. Yeah, that's okay. You try and do it with, with, um, with audio, and you have, like if someone if one phrase is much longer in one language than another language and much shorter, like 
having to play that audio slows down all of the other things, all the animations, everything else has to change, right? So so playing text is very easy, playing audio and adjusting it much, much harder. So um, if you know you want spoken text, you have to do a lot more work on the translation to get it to kind of fit the right times of framing. Um, and yes, there are, as, as someone's also putting it in the Discord, um, there are some interesting things on, on multilingual speech synthesis that's coming through where you can have uh, lip syncing into different languages and try and get your, your um, animation working, right? Um, and you know, lip syncing is hard. Uh, uh, there are better and better tools for doing AI for doing lip syncing. Um, what's interesting is often actually just a jabbering mouth is good enough, right? It's weird. Like, it's a bit weird, but if you choose to be far enough away if you, uh, from, from lip sync, right? So you're trying to actually lip sync like you can see me talking. If you can hear me and it's just my mouth going mm, like flapping when there is audio playing and still when there isn't audio playing, your brain will just go, oh yeah, it's it's not trying to be lip synced. It's just indicating he's talking, right? It's like a you know light bulb above me saying, oh, this is the person talking by having my mouth do that. Um, then that's that's not as jarring. But if you're lip synced and you're out or you're slightly wrong, that's more jarring. It's like part of that uncanny valley. It's the sort of uncanny valley of trying to get close with lip syncing and failing, or they're trying to get close with humans and then looking like zombies. Um, so yes, this this is a, a challenge when you have um, sounds and characters and and voice actors to try and get all these translations to work. Um, now I see that you've used jelly driven um, expressive face animations and and multilingual speech um, in the Cry Engine. Is that? Um, uh, yep, so, um, but, no, it's in size. I mean, but, so there are, three, there are three general approaches to lip syncing. So one is live capture of your actor talking so that you can see their lips moving and their face moving and you capture their face. And you can do that with markers or markless. I'll show you examples. Um, there is automated face models where you, you and one says, say, um, Jali Research, so J-A-L-I, um, is an example of a company that does this automated face model where you get a face model and a sound file and an AI that will do the movement of the mouse, mouth of your face model to match the audio, right? And it looks, the AI is used because it's not just volume, right? So you don't just like, if I'm quiet, I have my mouth closed small and if I'm loud, ah, right? So it's not just making my mouth go up and down with the amplitude it actually looks at how those sounds would be generated and tries to generate a mouth shape that will fit the audio file. Now that massively hard to do by hand, so we train AI systems to do it, they learn how to do that, and they're getting pretty good at, at normal human speech. Uh, or you can do it manually, which is incredibly slow, and just usually better to say, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to try and do manual lip syncing. I will just make my mouth flap. It'll be fine. Often true, right? So, so um, the massive amount of work to do it manually is not is just not worth it anymore. The idea of using tools to do it, fabulous, right? So um, so when we talk about these, these um, lip syncing um, and live capture, so this is one of the things we were doing... Um, with uh, to do some some face capture for me. So what? So there is a marker based approach, and you can see that here, where you put IR dots on the face, and then when the character talks, you track those IR dots. You use those IR dots to control the mesh of the face, and that makes the lips move and makes the cheeks move properly, and and the eyebrows go up and down, and and the chin move up and down, right? So so it generates a a realistic face mesh. The problem is it's missing the tongue, right? And surprisingly, it it doesn't make often a lot of logical sense, but we use the tongue when we're listening to people 
to improve our understanding of what they're saying. If you can't see their tongue or their tongue is absent, then it's actually harder to understand what they're saying. Um, so yes, the lip syncing isn't just the lips, it's also the whole face. Um, now we were using uh, Real Illusion, um, a person in, in uh, so, um, Burger, um, added some stuff in the in Discord showing uh, one of the software tools for this. We were using Real Illusion, which was doing mocap video. Uh, and if I switch over to, oh, um, I had closed down because my audio had stopped working. Um, but I'll just flip over to the Unreal Engine um, and show you what we're doing. But the, the idea is that we were, um, uh, we were actually able to, um, oh, I've got to get it to the right place to get that back. And if I go to the Unreal Engine, come on, spin it up. Okay. Um, and I'll go back to it and there. Right, so um, we have marker based and markerless. Uh, and so uh, if you have a look at the mocap from Real Illusion, it uses um, the uh, front-facing um, camera on the iPhone um, to actually do the... Uh, yeah, so it's using the iPhone. It uses the front-facing camera to generate the, um, the, f the face mesh as you record the audio. And then you can record that and put it in the game. Um, yeah, so so uh, that's obviously uh, one of my New Zealand students just realizing that I also Twitch stream to my Norwegian students. Um, so if I go into this one, uh, so yeah, so so this is so the idea here was that we were looking at having me and some other lecturers talk um, and. Okay, I can um, uh, restore selected. Um, okay, um, I was I was had to shut down my machine, which is why it's giving me that that error message. Um, and so this is the oh, what did you just crash out of the Unreal? Okay. Didn't realize it was going to completely crash out of Unreal when I said no. So um, this is showing, uh, okay, so I can crash that. So, uh, yep, this is all muted images. And if I click on, well, I can click on Bing or Daniel. Um, and here, Now, right. now that you can see that this was being generated by students um, and they've not got the animations in Unreal lined up, right? So I'll just pause that. Um, as you can see, that is disconnected from the audio, which you need to... Ah, I need to get him to stop speaking. Right, um, so that, that was the output result. I, um, the, the detail of how to line that up, you can see that this, this character had, um, was generated uh, from a standing pose. Real Illusion does that and it allows you to, to try and lip sync the, this face mesh, right? Um, so the students were working with Real Illusion last year. I'm having to take over this project, so I'm just in the middle of taking this over. But the idea is that uh, if you look at the the tool, it uses that, yeah, 
um, it uses that front facing camera to generate the get it back um, to generate the motion capture. Now, unfortunately, because we're going on mobile for that and we're doing an AR thing, it's too high polygon count. So I'm going to have to decimate the model. And at that point, some of the lip syncing might need to be thrown away because I need to get it to work on mobile. And to get it to work on mobile, you need the files to be really small. Uh, so I'll just bring up the Twitch stream. There we go. And go back there. Right. Um, so, so yeah, so there's this idea of, of, um, of using tools. And certainly the, the people suggesting that, that you can do some of the stuff with tools and um, that do a lot of automatic stuff is really good. As I said, with lip syncing, it's not just the face, unfortunately. There is cheeks and there's the jawline and the tongue moving and, and even whether you bear your teeth, um, all of that is important. And the game engine is getting much better. The, the tools associated with those, and some of those are expensive. So the real illusion stuff is, is about 1,200 New Zealand, so about you know six grand, um, probably about eight grand, um, Norwegian, eight to 10,000 Norwegian per year, right? So they make you pay for the tool, but the tool does a lot of the animation work for you. It, it helps you create characters, help you rig characters, means that you don't have to manually do that and hire an artist to do it. Um, if you are trying to lip sync and you're trying to get that, that to look right, unfortunately, humans are really well tuned to humans other human speaking so if you get it even slightly off the humans will look and go no that's wrong um if it's completely off they'll go oh we don't care but if it's just slightly wrong they'll really notice and you see that in movies um and unfortunately also in games now there are some tools and now i'm getting close to my hour um so if mod is uh, a uh, a great um, audio tool as is um, audacity i use audacity to do a lot of my sound editing uh, FMOD is a great um, sort of studio tool, is used by a lot of game developers as well. Um, you can download those and you can get FMOD running on your machine and just run through some online tutorials that show you how to use it. It's, it's, it's quite a powerful tool. Uh, I suggest that for some of you, you can go and look at some online um, sound libraries. Uh, so these, these are the Open Game App and, and um, Zapslat is um, uh, another place where you can get some free audio files because uh, you guys are students and so don't have a lot of money. Um, but if you're interested in royalty-free music, uh, then actually I, I should put the link in, but um, I think it's Splice. Um, yep, so Splice is actually a, a really nice service to give you a whole bunch of of little sound files that you can splice together, right? So the idea here is that it is specifically designed to create little audio splices that you can kind of DJ together to create what you want, right? So you don't have to work from raw guitar and drums and and, those, and piano or strings or whatever. You don't have to build up those components. You just use splices from the community, right? Uh, and so, so you can go in here and you can try for free. Um, and yeah, you, you, if you want to pay, there is, um, you can actually get right, licensed stuff. You can go in there and, and pay to have access ongoing to um, audio. But as a, as a new way of dealing with audio sounds and, and millions of royalty free sort of one shot loops, FX, MIDI stuff, um, for eight dollars a month, right? So the idea is that, that you get massive audio library without having to pay a huge amount to go and do all those recordings, right? So this is this is the kind of tool that people who are trying to build games by themselves use to bring in more audio sounds and different background sounds um, without having to kind of employ a full audio engineer to generate any of that. Okay, so Splice is quite good. Um, these are tools for doing that. Open Game Art um, is also used where it's got some sounds in there if you don't mm, have a feeling for what you want the sounds to be exactly, but you want some sounds, then yes, go and find those libraries um, there. They can be quite good. Uh, and you know, there's, there's also blogs about good audio tools to use. And as you'll see in here, 
there you wave and there's f mod and so yeah so some of those those tools are listed in this blog go and have a look if you if you are interested in in more sound tools the last thing i was going to say before i actually stop because i've used up my hour um is that all of those audio things right so lots of cool audio tools um out there you can understand how you use the sound where you use sound there are some interesting extensions so there are audio games for the blind uh which is interesting so you and and you see things like the alexa games so there were games for the alexa um echo and dot and where because it's just an audio interaction you created audio only games so it would you could talk to it and tell it instructions and it would read out scenarios and play background music and environmental music to draw you through the story right so there's kind of audio only games there are one of my master's students who's now doing his phd um he did games for the vr games for the blind we removed the the video feed in vr but just used positional audio and the rumble on the controllers so you could feel things in the world and you could hear them and hear where they were uh the game he developed was actually a uh a, 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 a god game you are a you are a god and you have villages and they pray to you and you help them out by like touching them and touching the the ground and fertilizing it and stuff and making it fertile for them um and so you had this you could hear an island you could hear the environment and you could hear the people praying to you and stuff right so you've got this kind of blind god phase right so there's some really interesting audio environments you can get into um there are all the guitar hero where the audio game the audio of the game is critical it's the kind of basically the whole point right otherwise it's just a pattern matching thing but the sound is what makes the game good and um i had a jedi lightsaber game that we were working on um for 16 years ago where where we actually used the audio so the idea of the game uh and it didn't ever quite get off but now with headphones i i'm gonna i'd like to try it again with binaural sound but the idea is that in the lightsaber battle that you have right when you're doing when you're doing a lightsaber training and the star wars movie where they have the wee zippy round drone that shoots at you part of the narrative of uh, star wars is that the force allows you to see into the future slightly right so that's how they're so good at things because they can predict where the laser things that's what the laser beams are coming from that's the blaster shots that's why they're able to get their lightsaber in in the way to block things that other people can't now we were looking at can you use audio in that sense of of looking into the future you know and so you play the audio slightly ahead of the video um with the intention that people paying attention to the audio will be able to predict where things are going to come from and therefore use that skill of hearing the audio as a vision of the future right so there are some some of those interesting research areas and how do you use sound to do interesting gameplay mechanics right so there there are these kind of ideas of of how you would use sound in a new way okay so that was my kind of wamp of lots of stuff about audio um in terms of of you actually getting audio into your games what you find is your particular game engine will have a tutorial on how to add a sound to an event and so just run through those tutorials grab these tools grab some sample files from um from here um where it's got a bunch of ui sounds um projectile sounds right so um random sound effects <laughs> so so you can you can go in and 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 go into these packs find find sounds um use the sounds these are royalty free so um yep so you can grab things with coins um and and hear the sounds of um what is an isometric coin oh that's sorry that's this this is open game art so it shows you the images and these are the sounds so you can download an RPG sound pack and you've got some previews you download it you log in you register you download the the file right so um 
so here we've got just downloading that pack it's got rpg sound pack use those sounds drop them in your game connect them to character actions and you will have sounds in your game which is, is is fantastic if you want audio tracks splicer use those sort of things um and and start and if, yeah start looking at how you create more engaging games by using audio tools okay so that was the end of me talking about sound um and i've now got the rgb sound pack uh, we can go in there and NPC character and a giant and a giant audio. As you can see, I use VLC as my um, and I'll go not a moment. Um, so right, apparently that's a giant sound. Whoa. Huh. Right, so those are sounds you can then use and to, they sound like some of those are sound like people being hit um and there's inventory sounds so beads bottle blubble chainmail cloth heavy cloth so ah there's coin ah, so if you've got coins and you want a coin sound in your inventory there you go there's a coin sound right you dump it into your game connect it to the coins bang you've got a coin sound happening uh and then just play with the audio right so that's that's a place to just get some stuff started once you're wanting to do more then you start using audacity and fmod to alter those sounds and you start using splice to bring in some of the audio okay so are there any questions that you guys have oh you can't hear any of that oh that's really annoying um sorry uh you could see it but you couldn't hear it that's annoying um if I go in, uh, let's see if I've got this. Where is my dear? That's why I put my desktop audio down. Sorry about that. Um, now you can hear that, except it's too loud. Um, oh, that's still too loud. It sounded much louder than me. Oh, yeah, that's still quite loud, but not as bad. Um, I'll just make it a wee bit. So, so yeah, so um, as I was saying, sorry, I'll, I'll, sorry you guys couldn't hear that. <sighs> Talking about audio and you can't hear the audio. Um, all right, so those, that's where the sounds that I was, was playing. Um, apparently those, the ogre, ogre sounds. That sounds like the, the sounds you would use if someone was being hit in battle. Um, and as I said, interface. Oh, not it was. In, it was an interface. It was inventory, and it was coin. And so that was the coin sound I was suggesting. All right, that sounds like a single coin dropping. All right, and that sounds like several coins. All right, so this idea is you you can play them, listen to those sounds, um, get an idea of them, and then just dump them into your game. Uh, it's a royalty free site. Uh, so you don't have to pay royalty for them anyway um, and you can look for sounds that are good to jump into your game okay so that's uh, and before you dump them in the game you can have a look at them in audacity because they are um, they're just wav files uh, and so if i do um, open with oh okay um, i should actually I think that's because it's in, I'll just dump it to D. And my D has got too many things in it. Um, but if I go modified, I can go wherever it went, wood sound. And then now I'm not in there, I can go uh, open with audacity. Oh, okay. I, it hasn't recognized. Oh. I'll have to find audacity slash fmod. Uh, I thought I had audacity on here as well as fmod. Anyway, um, so I can open that and start editing it. But yeah, that's you guys can play with those tools yourself. Okay, so um, yes, loud and clear. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad I fixed the problem. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's teething problems when you when you you're worried about your audio coming from your your machine. Okay, so. Uh, do we have any other questions? So on Discord, 
um, I see someone. So um, yeah, thank you, Berger, for for sharing. Uh, actually, I, I'll uh, if you don't mind, I will grab that YouTube video and put it in the Twitch comments. Um, so paste. So that was a YouTube video suggested by um, one of the students um, to go and have a look at at a particular. Um, uh, game engine that's using um, oh, so graph talk this year about special facial animation and multilingual speech, right? So, you know, the stuff I was saying that is hard, um, this is the... Yeah, I, I'm not actually allowed to... Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm not allowed to show you very much of this because, of course, there'll be a YouTube strike on it or anything if I put it up. But... Um, the idea here is that they've, this is, is SIGGRAPH stuff showing you how they're driving. There's an intense amount of expression conveyed in a character's speaking style alone. So uh, in Cyberpunk 2077, we found what we think is an extremely effective way of imparting that expression in the lip sync process. So uh, here's a couple. Yeah, so, so you can see that they, they, they'll, they'll take you through how the lip sync process is generating things like emotional expression, right? So there's some really nice stuff that's happening out there. Uh, I don't expect you guys to be able to do that level of stuff. And um, different tools give you different abilities and charge you different amounts, right? So, so this is this is there are some really nice videos about how to do that so thank you for sharing that particular link um hopefully um, I'll, I'll add that to the presentation as well um is there any other questions you guys have you can you can jump on discord and actually ask me straight audio or you can you can type um, yeah, or you can type into Twitch or into um, uh, into Discord or into Twitch. Um, so uh, yes, the burger was the student who had shared it. Um, I yes, it, it, it was nice because you were sharing something I was about to talk about, which is really kind of neat. Um, that I I kind of had a I didn't have that particular video, but I did have the whole yes, this is that's one way of generating that that in game um, system. Uh, but yeah, what, the the real one of the problems for lecturers is that the world moves so quickly; it's very hard to keep up with all the developments in all of these areas. So the best we can do is say, "Oh, this is the concept," and then you are you go out and you search for the current best example of that concept. Okay. Um, so there's a question in Twitch: uh, Are you a professor? Well. Yes, I'm a senior lecturer at a university. This is a course that I'm giving to Norway uh, as part of a uh, programming degree that happens in Norway. Uh, I also lecture here in New Zealand. Um, I'm, I'm actually now at 11.30 at night um, in the evening um, because I work both in New Zealand and Norway. Uh, okay, so, but my Norwegian students, do you have any more questions or we'll have a five minute break and I will then switch over into Discord and meet with one of the groups who were wanting to meet me after the lecture to discuss their code and discuss their project and make sure that things are making progress. If any of you, if, if any of the rest of the, the students want to have that personal dialogue and have a chat, I'll be, I'll be jumping over onto the Discord and hanging out there, having those discussions with the other groups. Um, Yes, yes, you, you were supposed to talk to me last week and it got very late. Um, so one of the students over at Discord were wanting to say, when I supposed to talk last week and the answer was yes, sorry. Um, I've, it's been the last week of my teaching here in New Zealand, so I've been marking hard out, um, including game projects, actually mo a lot of game projects. So my students had finished here um, and we can share some of those game projects with you guys to show you what my students here have been doing. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I, last week was a, a write-off, but I'm hanging around, I've done the marking, so I'm, I'm able to hang around and chat to you guys, okay? Okay, so if there are no more questions on Twitch, and you guys have got an idea of kind of the overview of audio, and now you're gonna go away, use those tools, dump them to your game, start using some of those um, 
the those sound files, start playing with editing them, think about how the sound helps your game and helps your game feel more alive. Um, and you can start playing with some of that audio stuff. That'll be great, okay? Um, right, well, um, I'll see you next week. And if you don't come up with a topic for me to give you, to teach you, I will pick the next thing that I think is really interesting and we'll have that as a lecture. Um, so I know I'm, I'm thinking we could dig into some of the way game physics works um, because uh, there's some really interesting things in, in timings and physics and the way um, you manage physical interactions in game engines. Uh, or we could uh, dig a bit more into ray tracing and how uh, Unreal 5 looks like it's using ray tracing to have unlimited uh, pixel models, um, unlimited um, vertex uh, models. So you have a like, massive number of, of triangles uh, in your models and using ray tracing to generate the appropriate visuals so that you don't, so that you automatically decimate the models and have them still look fantastic, but not be too slow to render. Um, so there's some like interesting discussions around how ray tracing works, and so we could dig a bit more into that. So um, there are some interesting ideas on in what I could talk about, but it'd be really good for you guys to give me feedback about where you're at, so that next week we can give you something that's on topic for where your games are. Great. Okay, I'll see you guys next week, and I'll disappear over to Discord. Have a great day. Have a great Friday, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Now I have to just find my stop.